Um, welcome. It is Blitz time. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm Carol Palmer. I'm the Associate Dean for Research at the Information School. Um, and this is the last event um, in a series of the I Welcome activities. So um, I'm glad you all could join us today. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Washington is located on the homeland of the Coast Salish peoples. We pay respect to the elders, past and present, and the living and future descendants who have lived on and cared for these lands and waterways since time immemorial, and whose practices and lives continue to enrich and develop in relationship to the land, waters, other inhabitants, and guests. Okay, so we have an exciting lineup of short research talks that we're gonna share with you today. We also have someone taking pictures. So if you would prefer not to have uh, photos taken of you, please raise your hand and we will distribute a no photo button to you. So don't be shy, um, it's fine. Uh, we just wanna make sure we, we get that done. So go ahead and raise your hand and I'm gonna continue to tell you about why this is such an important event for us. Um, it's, we know that research is not always very visible to students. You know, you engage with faculty and other people in the school largely through the classroom, office hours, but yet um, there's an amazing array of research that's happening, uh, but seemingly behind the scenes, but in fact, for the researchers themselves, it is really front and center right up there with the instruction that they do with you in the classroom. But also, in addition, um, one of the great things about being at the University of Washington that I hope you already know is that it is a world-class research university. And so we love to talk about our rankings. Uh, we're always in the top 20, 25 for you know, actual world rankings. But we're especially proud of the fact that we are often in the top five, sometimes three, of national rankings, and particularly four public universities. And we're very proud of the fact that we can rise that high in a public university. So also, I think it's worth knowing that uh, the whole idea of research is very central to the vision of the University of Washington. Uh, right there in their vision, vision statement, it says, discovery is at the heart of the university. And then also, in this school, in your iSchool, uh, we are renowned for very rich, uh, really uniquely multidisciplinary, um, and I could go on and on, um, you know, cutting edge, transformational, we have all sorts of words for what we do. Um, and so I'm not going to give you a lot of background, but I am going to point you to our website where you can explore. You can explore what we call our areas of research excellence. It's a very broad set of areas, but it's all held together by this focus on information. You can also explore all the different centers and groups and labs that we have where there's multiple projects going on and engage in, a lot of engagement with students. So I, I invite you to look at that. And there's also a page that lists our recent funded research awards. And so there you can see the new projects that are getting resources that often will have student um, opportunities with them, with very specific projects. So keep an eye on that. But I do want to spend a minute just to think about, and, you know, why would you want to get involved in research? And I think, you know, from my perspective, it's just an incredible way to learn more deeply and complement what you're doing in the classroom. Um, and also, it's a way to make a contribution. Um, also, and then on top of that, the things you learn doing research are very transferable to other kinds of areas you will work in or responsibilities you might have um, in a position. You learn to be very systematic, you learn to be very analytical, and ethical in the way you conduct your research, um, and you also learn to communicate uh, really complex ideas to a range of audiences. And so those are skills that you might not get in the classroom that you can get from the research experience. Now, I don't know how many of you of our, our presenters, presenters today did not plan on doing research or getting a PhD when you first went to college. Okay, I thought so, I thought so. So we are very much like many of you, I think, where it really wasn't on our radar. Um, but what happens is, you know, you get in, 
to the research environment, it's very engaging. It pulls you in. It's very exciting um, and challenging. And that intellectual exploration is a very intense kind of learning. Um, and again, making that contribution to some kind of collective future. Um, so today, you'll hear about a lot of projects. Um, and to me, they always represent, I think of research as a kind of optimism. It's an optimism, it's an active optimism, in that you're exploring, you're investigating, you're creating, but you're doing that to change lives, to make a difference, to improve information systems, improve uh, the human condition. And so you'll get an exposure today to a lot of different opportunities. Um, some of the people you will hear from have student openings or opportunities now, but many might not have them at this moment, but could have them later. So what I want to do, we're going to have only this hour, it's a lot to do, but to encourage you to follow up with presenters later, and you know, even if they don't have opportunities now, have a conversation, because really, we do love to talk about our research, as you will see, um, and we love to have students involved. In fact, it's essential that we have students involved. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is our format. We're going to have what we call lightning talks. Uh, we have 14 presentations. How many minutes do you have? <laughs> Very good. Three minutes. We have a timer up here. We do not have a gong like we had in previous years, which turned out to be a little too much. Um, and when you're um, done, please pass the mic to Matt along with the clicker, and we'll uh, keep things rolling that way. So I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, and that's Katie Davis. Okay. Hi, everyone. All right. Great to see everyone. So how many people here are informatics students? Wow. Most of you. Any MLIS or MSIM students? Okay. Definitely clustered here. So this is great. Fantastic. Well, I apologize that after I talk, I'm going to have to rush off to my Info 300 course that I'm teaching about research methods. Um, so I'm Katie Davis. I'm an associate professor here at the iSchool, and I'm a co-director and co-founder of the Digital Youth Lab. Um, and we're basically a group of faculty um, and students, both undergrad and grad, um, who are studying technology's role in young people's lives, both their learning, their well-being, just any aspect of their lives. For me in particular, um, my work, I, I see it as divided into two pieces. I study what young people are doing with technology, um, and typically I'm focused on teens and typically focused on um, the intersection of technology and well-being and learning, but sometimes I go a little bit younger, sometimes I go a little bit older. Um, and then I take what I learn from my studying and I apply it to design, designing positive tech experiences for and with youth. And so I do a lot of co-design. Um, my work sits at the intersection of child development, human-computer interaction, and learning sciences. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. And I just want to say a little bit about the kinds of work I'm doing right now in each of these areas. So right now, when I, what I'm studying, um, I'm really interested with some colleagues um, and students in exploring how interaction design affects teens moment by moment emotional states while they're engaging in social media. And so I use a lot of different methods to explore this question. Um, I use experience sampling, interviews, observations, um, all sorts of stuff um, to really try and map on uh, emotional states and interaction design and try to figure out where design is actually impacting and having a role in um, young people's emotions and well-being. Um, and then I also design um, positive tech experiences. So right now I'm exploring how we can reorient the typical teen social media experience away from um, habitual use, like mindless scrolling, falling down the rabbit hole, and towards meaningful interactions. And so one of the projects that I've been working on in that regard is Locus, which is a mobile app intervention to promote teens' intentional social media use. Um, you can see a couple screenshots here. Basically, it's a wrapper app where we're controlling the entry experience into a social media platform. Um, so whenever a teen opens up a particular um, app such as TikTok or Instagram, instead of being taken straight to the app, they are prompted with a couple times a day, not every single time. But they're prompted with a, just a reflection question. And this is trying to reorient them towards a meaningful engagement 
with their social media. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to pass it over to Amy. If you're interested in getting involved in the Digital Youth Lab, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we have a bunch of PhD students who are happy to talk opportunities with you. All right, mic check. So, uh, next slide. My name is Amy Coe. I'm a professor here in the Information School and adjunct in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. That name gets longer every single year. And I study all of the stuff in this picture. Um, teachers, teaching students computer science, computing topics, data, data literacy topics, students learning, all of the technologies that they're learning, um, things that happen outside of the classroom as well, all of the learning that happens in after school programs or even in professional settings and the workplace. And the driving problem that we do for a lot of this is I really think about the world as becoming increasingly computational but also increasingly incomprehensible at the same time. Um, so thinking about that collective struggle to understand computation, that's what we really think about deeply. These are all of my PhD students and postdocs and some of my collaborators. Um, we're just starting a center um, tentatively called the Center for Computing, Learning, and Society with um, Ben Shapiro over in the Allen School. Um, and we publish across a lot of different disciplines, computing education, human-computer interaction, learning sciences, and more. So here are a few examples of the things that we do. Um, one example is thinking about creative sense-making, the kinds of creative literacies that come about when people are using computing to express things. So here's a new programming language that we just um, released a beta version of that's thinking about how to center accessibility and language inclusion in creating. And if you think about programming languages now, most of them don't center either of those. They're mostly inaccessible to people with disabilities. They're mostly inaccessible to people who can't read English. And so we're trying to do the opposite of those two in this project. Um, we also think a lot about critical sense making. So what does it mean for youth to understand computation in the world, especially in socio-political terms? How is computing changing power structures in the world? How is it centralizing and moving power and shifting it? Um, what does it mean for a 10-year-old to understand and think about those kinds of notions of power in the context of computing? Um, we do a lot on impact too, not just um, PDFs and research papers and digital libraries, but things like making new pathways for teacher education, um, new textbooks and media, new state and federal policies that we've advocated for, um, lots of popular press, and our work has impacted a lot of learning technologies as well. Like if you recognize this Swift Playgrounds product that Apple released, that was based on our research from about, about 10 years ago. Um, if you want to engage, I have a, a way that you can participate in helping on the Wordplay project that I mentioned called Word Playpen. You can go to that link. That's how you can sign up and join. It's basically a local open source community that really advances all of those challenges around um, accessibility and language inclusion in the design of this language. That's it. Um, hello everyone, my name is Nassim Parvin. I'm a, a new associate professor and the associate dean of ideas uh, here at the iSchool. I'm very excited to be with you all here. It's the first time I talk about my research since I joined. Uh, so in my copious uh, you know, free time, I'm hoping to re-establish the Design and Social Justice Studio, which is an interdisciplinary group of uh, students and faculty to think about the ethics and politics of um, design. Uh, and especially, one of the features of the studio is to make things. We want to make things, experiment with different ways, different principles, uh, different modes of uh, intervention uh, that can um, you know, offer alternate possibilities for technologies. So I'm going to give you three projects that you can you know, join uh, in uh, with me. I'm trying to revamp these. Uh, one is on smart forests and, smart, uh, and sensing bodies. Uh, so a lot of smart forest initiatives are about mining and using nature. So the capitalist ways of thinking are uh, driving those projects. But what if we think about uh, sensors and integration of sensors in um, you know, more than human world as a way of uh, thinking and being with plants and animals uh, in ways that are more capacious, caring, uh, and really uh, engages with the kinds of knowledge that they produce. Uh, so for example, this is a project by Tim Knowles is a tree that is drawing uh, a pattern on, a, on an easel, so a very different kind of uh, data collection than what you might uh, think with sensor technologies. This is actually a bunch of sensors hugging a tree, so even in the form that a project takes, it's very different than the one on the left. 
uh, by, uh, so so um, uh, these are some projects that you can check out to see what I mean by that. This is a, a project um, that you can also check from my studio, sensingbodies.lmc.gothic.edu. At some point it will be here. Uh, it's a, a series of experiments that center feminist ways of being with, thinking with, and feeling with plants. So how can we uh, design experiments, in this case an installation for a museum setting, that helps us reorient uh, orient the way that we think about, uh, about plants. Another project, theoretical work that um, I have just started is, uh, I'm, I'm tentatively calling it chat GPT, make me sound white. Uh, so if you are a non-native speaker and you, know, you want to put an anonymous comment, it's very useful to like, ask chat GPT to edit your comment. But then something is lost in that translation. A certain ways, way of thinking and expressing and voicing is lost. This is a piece with you know, other technologies in the past that have similarly reinforced uh, white male voices. Uh, so you can engage with that. And finally, you can be a junior managing editor with Catalyst, which is a journal that I'm running. And we just published our latest issue on interdisciplinary collaborations. We are always looking for students with good, good organizational skills and uh, visual design skills. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Emma Spiro. I am an associate professor here at the Information School and uh, adjunct in the Department of Sociology and Human Centered Design and Engineering. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for an Informed Public and I also co-found and currently co-direct the Data Science and Analytics Lab. Um, so when I was sitting in your seat not too long ago, I was studying applied mathematics, Facebook had just hit the scene, and I said, numbers are really cool but people are where it's at. Um, and we wanted to think about uh, social media and the impact of articulating our social relationships online as opposed to just face-to-face -face context. So I'm a sociologist by training and for the past decade or so I've been fascinated in trying to understand how people make sense of the world and the information they're getting when they're in non-routine settings. So really disrupted cases. If this room started shaking right now, knock on wood, that's not going to happen. But what do we do? We turn to our neighbors and we turn to our social media to find out what's going on. And so when crises happen, people sort of struggle together to make sense of the world. Um, and that's what we study, those kind of phenomena. In particular, we've been focused on trying to understand how rumors, misinformation, and disinformation spread, especially in online settings. You know, we've learned a lot about the language we use in these um, research projects, about the fact that we are all vulnerable to these kinds of phenomena, and the fact that we have to participate in order for them to succeed. And so a few years ago, we institutionalized our research agenda here in the Center for an Informed Public, um, and with my colleagues, we try to understand the impact of misinformation on our society today. So to name a, a few projects that we're engaged in at the CIP, um, in particular myself, we study podcasts. How do the kinds of information that we just listen to passively as we're walking across campus affect how we believe about the world? Right? Who are the main players there and how do they influence us? Um, we have a project to look at the post road versus way um, misinformation around abortion, around procedures, about medical safety, around law and policy. Um, we have projects that look at real-time responses to election information and rumors. So how can we get a huge team of students and faculty together and researchers to understand in real time what the information space looks like during elections and respond to it um, and help election officials, help journalists, and help each other make sense of that information. Um, so we've learned a lot over the past decade. There's lots of ways to get involved. Most immediately, I teach um, a directed research group. It's listed as Research Seminar INSC 578, but it's open to students, all students at the Information School and across campus. And it's a way to get hands-on experience doing research with us. Uh, so if you're interested in that, we also have a lot of opportunities for paid research assistantships and summer experiences as well. So please look us up at the CIP, and I'll turn it over to my co-founder, Jevin, to tell you more about some of our projects. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emma. 
I'm Jevin West. Uh, I'm an associate professor here in the Information School. And like Emma, I study this topic of misinformation. Um, and first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming here today because most of the research projects I do are not just run with students, but they're run by students. They lead a lot of the projects. I'm going to highlight two of them today. So I have been studying misinformation in many different forms in the institution of science and society more broadly, but I've been spending more time in 2023 working with doctors, not just in online forums in the ways in which misinformation spreads, but also in offline forums, in the actual emergency care clinics. And I've had the opportunity to talk to organizations and these doctors, and they're spending more and more of their time every day talking about misinformation instead of just taking care of of the patient. One story in particular that really sits in my mind is a story of an individual that came to a hospital here locally in Seattle with an arm lacerated so bad it was literally hanging from the elbow, dripping blood, um, and the person came in during COVID and they wouldn't let him in because he had to get a nose swab so they could test for COVID. He thought that was going to cause cancer and he walked out. It was the last the doctors ever saw that individual. That's how much people will follow this misinformation. And the, the thing that he was worried about was this thing called ethylene oxide, which is a new rumor of many rumors. There's infinite rumors. You're playing whack a mole a lot of the time. And doctors don't have time to stop those all the time. So we've been wanting to figure out both you know, how this occurs offline, but also online, and the role that doctors and experts actually play in these online forums. It turns out they do play a pretty important uh, role. And I'll mention that there's, there's three students uh, here that were running this uh, project. And what we wanted to know is what position do they play, and are they important both in the pro-science or pro-vaccination in this case, or and the anti-vaccination cases. I wish I had more time to tell you more of the research, but I'll just point out that these little dark notes here turn out to be the experts, the ones with P the PhDs or the MDs, that people do care about experts, and they care about them in both the anti-vaccination uh, communities and the pro-vaccination communities. We wanted to look at what mechanisms they're using and how these actually translate into that story that I mentioned in the emergency clinic. So that's one of the things, one of the mechanisms by which misinformation might be directed in potentially good ways, but also in bad ways. I want to highlight another project that also is something that's engaging the medical community, but all of us as well, and that is, of course, ChatGPT and generative AI. And one thing that we've been starting to notice is the brittleness of this particular technology. Um, and so I just want to give you one example that's also led by a student here, um, where uh, there was a paper that went viral around the world, translated in many different languages. It was published in Nature Human Behavior that said, look, ChatGPT has the ability, has this emergent ability to have what's called zero-shot reasoning, this ability to solve analogies. And we said, that's pretty amazing. So we looked at it, and then we gave it the analogies, and it did solve it. This is where they do really well. And then we said, well, let's just give it a slightly different variant in the input. This is how, how, how well it does. So this is a, a general trend that we're looking for uh, across a lot of these uh, uh, apparent abilities. Turns out it's much more brutal than we thought. So that's, uh, that's it for today. I don't have any current uh, open positions, but please email if you're interested, because these can open sometimes weekly and monthly. Thank you. Okay, um, got too many things to hold. Okay, um, my name is Stacey Wedlake. I am a research scientist here at the iSchool with the Technology and Social Change Group, or TASHA. And what you see here is a slightly blurry map of um, CenturyLink's um, internet service across the city. And the dark uh, gray dots are where you can subscribe to CenturyLink with the highest internet speeds. And the red dots is where only the really slow, really not broadband speed is available. And um, up there in the north end, you can get super fast speed for $50 a month. And down at the south end, you can get really terrible internet from CenturyLink for $50 a month. So um, um, I'm here to talk about digital redlining. And a lot of times when we talk about internet service, we're talking about digital divides. Do you have a computer? Do you have an internet? And digital redlining is really trying to understand the why, the causes. So um, digital redlining is how digital technologies amplify and continue structural discrimination and racism. And there's lots of different ways um, it does that, but one way um, I'm really interested in exploring is internet service and availability. So in order to understand this, you need data. And unfortunately, internet and broadband data is just really terrible in the US. There's my little happy dumpster fire here. Um, and so one, some of the key ways to understand and measure 
um, internet availability is, first of all, you need to know if it's there and how fast the service provider is claiming is available, which the SEC does now have, but this is all um, service provider reported data. Um, you need to know the quality, so beyond speed, what's the lag, jigger, et cetera, et cetera, not available. Cost, not available. So in, in order to measure redlining, like you saw previously, like we need granular data. And some of this data is at higher aggregation level, but it doesn't really help us measure what streets, what neighborhoods do or do not have service. Um, there have been some uh, researchers and activists that have been trying to collect this data at a more granular uh, level, uh, which you saw on that previous map, but it's really scattershot. So that's some of what we're trying to do with my uh, wonderful collaborators. Uh, and so uh, Ben Nickerson, who is an informatics student who actually found me at the research splits last year, has been trying to figure out how to scrape some pricing data, and then been also working with a PhD uh, candidate oops, uh, in a geography to do some spatial analysis. Uh, in the future, we are really excited to collaborate with community organizations to try to understand uh, what internet quality people are actually getting at the household level, and then also doing some qualitative work to better understand people's lived experience with um, subscribing and trying to uh, maintain internet service. Uh, we don't have any formal opportunities right now, but I'm always open to talking to uh, motivated students. Thanks. All right putting on a different hat um, uh, here. Uh, so um, the Tasha Research Director, uh, Jason Young, is um, on a plane to Nome, Alaska at the current moment, so he asked if I present um, and, and for him. Uh, and so um, I mentioned Tasha a second ago, but Tasha explores the role of uh, digital technologies in building more open, um, inclusive, and equitable societies. And I'm here to talk about the Tasha Research cl Cluster so, do you want to help shape a new research space? Are you a critically-minded scholar in search of an academic community that prioritizes care? Do you have radical ideas that don't always fit in your classes, love to rail against oppressive institutions, or feel passionate about making real-world change? Do you love free food? Well, the R Tasha Research Cluster may be for you. So what are we trying to do? This is a new initiative seeking to establish a collectively run, managed space in which scholars can come together uh, and experiment and perform uh, the types of methods, relationships, and processes that support ethical collaborations and community-engaged research. So what sort of activities are we going to do? Well, you would get to help decide. Um, so, but we have some ideas we've been um, discussing uh, co-writing research proposals, engaging in collectively defined research projects, setting up a speaker series that brings uh, radical scholars and community um, activists to campus, participating in how-to research workshops on topics such as creating a budget, uh, empowering community partners, running interdisciplinary research teams, and so on, uh, creating resources for navigating inequitable structures built into academia, figuring out a better name for this group than Tasha Research Cluster, and much, much more. So, how do you join? Reach out to Jason Young, um, and we are currently planning activities, including planning our um, regular meeting time for winter quarter, and um, we're currently in process of exploring possible four credit options to support uh, participation. So, again, interested? Uh, email Jason Young, that is, Young JC2 at UW.edu. Thanks so much. It's going to be hard to follow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I am Tanu Mitra. I'm an assistant uh, professor at the Information School. Uh, I started in 2020. Previously, I was at Virginia Tech as uh, uh, in the computer science department. And uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today is largely done by my amazing students. There were, we have a bunch of PhDs as well as undergrads who have uh, led many of this work. Uh, so we study and build large-scale uh, social computing system to understand and counter problematic information online. And our lab is called the Social Computing and Algorithmic Experiences Lab or SCALE Lab. 
And the work uh, that we do uh, could be divided into these two threads, understanding and countering. So in the understanding uh, thread, uh, we basically uh, use uh, large-scale quantitative analysis, natural language processing methods uh, to study different online phenomena, conspiracy theories, online extremism, online narratives, news narratives, and so on. And in the countering space, we try to design uh, interventions, uh, systems to nudge people to better information consumption, uh, to make them break through their filter bubble, for example. Other Tube is the system we design on top of YouTube, which allows you to be exposed to other people's uh, uh, YouTube filter bubble. Um, uh, and uh, the other area of work that I'm really excited about, and we have currently a few ongoing uh, direction in, in this, in this uh, under this theme, is algorithm audits. So what really is an audit? So this, this word audit comes from the social science world, where what you basically do, you, you try to change a certain inputs, such as age, gender, race, and try to see how the system, how the algorithm would react to that uh, particular change. And then it could be their search or recommendation algorithms dif uh, behaving differently based on those changes. So we have run a bunch of different audits, sock puppet audits, crowdsourced audits, uh, audits in collaboration with companies called cooperative audits across a range of different uh, uh, companies. And these work also have uh, a lot of impacts, policy impact in the government. You could also inform trust and safety teams in the industry. Currently, we are taking these methods, uh, infrastructure, uh, and, and you know the, the frameworks that we have built to audit large language models uh, to figure out how their responses might align or misalign based on certain demographic attributes, right? So how do you study uh, cultural, what are the different cultural biases for certain social constructs when you investigate these large language models? And here is an example uh, which uh, from another paper where essentially it, it, the, the response uh, is, is really uh, culturally sensitive. And so I'm not going to read, read it. Um, uh, we and obviously all this work uh, we try to do with stakeholders. So one of the uh, key stakeholders, people on the ground who are affected by this information space, by this information, are fact checkers. So we have been working with fact checkers around the world uh, to to figure out what are the human and technological infrastructures that support their fact checking work. And and this resulted in a two year long collaboration where we've designed and built a fact checking system with the fact checkers and obviously not for them to figure out how they can discover misinformation in a better way on uh, like video-based platforms. There are some ongoing uh, research in this direction where, where, where we are trying to figure out what are the challenges as well as the opportunities that generative AI uh, might be posing in this fact-checking work. So if you're interested in any of those uh, directions that I talk about and want to get involved. Uh, there are a couple of different ways. Of course, email me. You could also, there are students who register for credit, independent study, research capstone. I'm offering one in spring of 2024. So this is the right time to kind of think about it if you're planning your next uh, year's uh, course coursework. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Garrido. I'm, I also work for the... Okay, I gave up all my... Oh, no, no, man. What is going on with this? Thank you. I also work for the Technology and Social Change Group. I'm a principal research scientist there. So, as Stacy mentioned, we work on understanding how technology influences different aspects of social, economic, and cultural development, particularly communities that face challenges, social, political, cultural, in access and use of technology. Thank you very much. So I wanted to bring you this, this project as an example. So this is a collaboration with TASHA, the United Nations, and the International Federation for Library Associations, trying to understand what is the role of inclusive connecti connectivity and meaningful access to information in advancing development. So three things that we're trying to understand. How do we measure inclusive connectivity? Stacy already brought up about broadband and redlining. So how do we measure that using publicly available, public available data? How do we design data visualization tools that are based on equity-centered design? Not only in the back end, but in the data that we include, in the voices that are represented and not on those databases, and in the skills that people can have to access and use those data tools. And the third one, how do we design inclusive data practices to give voices to all those communities that are not currently represented in government data sets? 
This is an example of what we did. So how do we define inclusive connectivity? We define as the rights and capacity to use, create, and share technology and information in ways that are meaningful to people, communities, and organizations. We use 29 indicators, the UN, in three areas of social development, connectivity, gender equity, and freedom. One little comment, gender equity is still considered binary by the UN, all the efforts to make it more uh, inclusive of different gender identities. So what do we find uh, with this type of, 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 of research? We are more deeply connected, but a lot less free. So in the past seven years, how many of you know about the UN 2030 agenda? Okay, it's a very important agenda for development. Since the agenda started in 2015, 20%, we have 2.3 billion people online. We've lost almost eight points in freedom scores in the world. So sorry for delivering the bad news. Just an example of what you can do. We created this visualization tool. This is an example of the analysis that you can do with it. It's a tool that is designed to some extent with equity center approaches to data, um, data sharing, data gaps, and also data visualization. You can check it out. And you are um, always welcome to reach out to us, at Tasha, for opportunities, as it could be for the design of equity center uh, frameworks for data and also for the role of libraries in advancing uh, public development. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Eileen Kaliskan and I'm an assistant professor at the Information School and by courtesy in computer science and engineering, I'm also a fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution because my research on artificial intelligence bias and ethics has policy implications as we provide empirical evidence that, pro that informs tech policy. I'm affiliated with Value Sensitive Design Lab, the UW NLP group, RAISE, Responsible AI Experiences and uh, Systems Center, as well as the Tech Policy Lab. My research primarily focuses on developing methods for generative AI to evaluate how they acquire human-like associations and biases. And I focus primarily on the language domain, as well as multimodal domains that are implicitly supervised through language, such as vision language or speech language. And accordingly, by developing these methods that are scientifically grounded and established on literature that has been developed over decades, we are able to provide new methods for AI to understand why, for example, they generate images of men that typically feature career-related attire and look at the pattern that we have for women in this case. What is happening in these models? And accordingly, we see that generative AI models amplify bias. They do not just perpetuate bias. And this has many implications for ethics and society. And we are trying to evaluate the societal impact of generative AI models as they acquire sociocultural information from large-scale data sets and from our imperfect society. And accordingly, this has tech policy implications, and we would also like to understand human AI bias interaction. As we are playing with generative AI systems, using them to automate mundane tasks in our daily lives, or in some cases, to make consequential decisions that determine life's outcomes and opportunities, we do not necessarily understand how the problematic issues learned from society in AI are affecting individuals, users, stakeholders, humans in the loop. And we have many open questions in these research directions. Accordingly, I've been working with undergraduate students, master's students, as well as PhD students to answer these open questions in this research area that is rapidly evolving. And we have opportunities for research assistance. I have a directed research group. This is the second year. We also have independent and research credit options, and I look forward to hearing from you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Miranda Bilardi Lewis. I'm an assistant professor of Native North American Indigenous Knowledge here in the Information School. And I'd like to acknowledge my co PI, Dr. Carol Palmer. And the project that we're going to be talking to, or I'm talking about today is Data Services for Indigenous Scholarship and Sovereignty. We call it DSIS. And um, this is about stewarding indigenous research data with the CARE principles. Now, um, a quick Indian 101, Native 101. A lot of Native folks have a really contentious relationship with research. We have been researched, in our view, um, to death. We have been, we are the objects of study and not the collaborators of research. And so there is this distrust towards institutions, especially museums, libraries, and archives where we don't feel represented, we don't, look, we don't feel um, that we are respected, that our knowledge is respected in these information institutions. And so addressing that is a really big job. That's not what we're doing here. <laughs> uh, but it is something to start from. And by naming it, we want to make sure that we're starting off our project by acknowledging settler colonialism and that is an ongoing process. And so when we look at um, data, we look at the artifacts of research, not just the products, not just the articles, book chapters, um, and other, other products of research. We're looking at the data and what happens to that and what happens for future researchers. So if we can look at repositories, at archives and library collections as places that we can leave breadcrumbs for future researchers, the future scholars, future students, to see themselves reflected and to see methods of looking at research and approaching research in a way that is respectful to the home community, then we could do that through um, a project like this. This is Mellon funded, and we um, started off by working with indigenous scholars here at the University of Washington. Um, indigenous scholars and also non-native or settler scholars that I have extremely um, respectful relationships with the communities that they conduct research with. And so we asked them, what would it be like, what kind of um, conditions would need to be in a repository for you to feel comfortable putting your research there? And that, is, that was the basis of our conversations with them, asked them about the process for themselves. And we um, have different project partners. Here in the iSchool, we have Dr. Carol Palmer, uh, myself, Dr. Sandy Littletree, Dr. Nick Weber, and right now um, our RA is Nestor Guerrero, who's in the MLIS program. We have also, um, we're working with scholars in American Indian Studies, AIS, and UW Libraries, QDR, Washington State, and um, let's see, oh, I have the clicker. <laughs> So when we're looking at um, the care principles, you know, these are aspirational documents. So when you think of aspirational, how do you put those into concrete methods? And this is something that we're doing. We have unpaid, paid and unpaid roles. Um, we do have capstone opportunities that are possible. We hopefully will have an RA opportunity. Um, we're still trying to figure out the budget for funding. But um, if you're interested in indigenous data, uh, talk to us anyway. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Melanie Walsh and I'm an assistant professor in the information school here. Uh, in my research, I investigate how data and computational methods shape contemporary culture and how they can be used to understand culture in turn. So today, there is more data available about music and what kind of music people are listening to, books and what kind of books people are reading, uh, movies, video games, art, etc. And we can use this data to understand why people care about these materials, what it means to them, how it impacts our society, and also how all of this data is being used by the industries that publish and sometimes gatekeep these materials, um, and also profit from these materials. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about two projects where we're actually curating and creating data that hasn't existed yet, or doesn't exist in a comprehensive way yet. So I am the co-editor of the Post45 Data Collective, which is a peer-reviewed 
open access repository, repository for cultural data from 1945 to the present. Um, sometimes we go a little bit beyond that. Um, so for example, we have published data about all of the winners and judges of major literary prizes from the last 100 years. And that has enabled us to show, for example, that the judges for the National Book Award, which is going to be announced next week, have overwhelmingly been white for most of the award's existence, but in the last several years, the jury has been getting a lot more diverse, and actually this year's jury is the most diverse ever. So I am always looking for students to help curate um, data sets like this, so if you're interested in that, please reach out. <clears throat> and the second project that I just briefly wanted to talk about, um, with funding from Mozilla, we um, are starting a project called Responsible Datasets in Context, where we are curating data sets that can be used in undergraduate classrooms or classes, um, especially about data and programming, <clears throat> that come with um, extensive information about the social and historical context of the data, because that's always something that's really important to consider and something that's often missing. Um, and I'm going to be work list looking for at least one graduate student to help me um, with this project. So if you're interested in either of these opportunities, please reach out. And I also wanted to just quickly plug, um, last summer I helped found, fund, excuse me, found a uh, new initiative called the Humanities Data Science Summer Institute. Um, and I believe that it's gonna be happening again this year. So if you're interested in that, please look out for um, applications. Last year was due in, in February or March. Thank you. because three minutes is, I think, the hardest format to talk to. So um, uh, my name's Jamie Snyder. I'm an associate professor in the Information School. I am the lead for the Visualization Studies Research Studio. Um, I'm also an adjunct uh, associate professor in human-centered design and engineering, and I'm an affiliate in the Behavioral Research and Tech and Engineering Center that's in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology. I'm also an affiliate in the newly formed uh, West African Digital Mental Health Alliance. Um, so um, in VSRS, the Visualization Studies Research Studio, we use design, and, um, design research and qualitative methods to learn about the ways that people create and use visual representations of information, data, and knowledge to collaborate and coordinate. Um, visualizations, as we have seen by in many of the um, presentations today, play a pivotal role in um, a lot of the information systems that we, we create and we deploy. Um, the, as a result, the conventions that we use, the standards that come into play, really sh shape and form the sense that we make of the data that we have access to across a range of different audiences and a range of different contexts. So um, a lot of the, the um, work that we do in VSRS focuses on the visual representation of information for vulnerable, conditionally vulnerable or systematically under-resourced communities. Um, in doing that, we think about things like um, those who self-track to manage serious mental illness um, and the ways that standard approaches to visualizing data can introduce really misplaced normative expectations and inappropriate behavioral targets. And even though a vast majority of the world's environmental resources most endangered by climate change are under the stewardship of small coastal communities and indigenous, um, uh, indigenous populations, the scientific visualizations that often drive discussions of policy change are not typically aligned with vernacular forms of knowledge, um, vernacular ways of knowing the, the natural world. So in the work that we do in, um, in the Visualization Studies Research Studio, we ask three basic questions. What information, data, and knowledge do visual encoding systems make visible? How are the lived experiences represented, a range of lived experiences represented or not represented through those visual encoding systems? And what are the social, communicative, and critical implications of visualization design choices? 
So when we create and use visual representations, what information is being lost? What information is being highlighted? What information is being obscured? What lived experiences are being surfaced? How are we presenting what we think we know from knowledge, or from data, excuse me? Um, one of the keystones of the visualization studio is uh, the ground of visualization design process, which is a, a critical um, a methodology that focuses on visual elicitation and co-design. Um, we do a lot of work in partnership with clinicians and practitioners um, in the mental health space, in the chronic health space, and the new grant that, um, that Carol mentioned in environmental data, especially um, uh, local data collection. Um, so, uh, I have here listed a few of the research projects that are ongoing. Um, we're doing work related to biodiversity education in coastal communities. Um, uh, I know I just saw something here. Um, uh, the uh, community health for uh, displaying community health for members of the Ethiopian diaspora. Um, collaborating with uh, collaborative decision making um, with folks over at Children's Hospital for kids with chronic kidney disease and on the digital mental health in, in low resource contexts. I also wanted to give a shout out, um, let, this past summer we uh, went to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for the first iSchool Ethiopia study abroad program. It's a design field study, it was, it was great. Um, uh, hopefully we're gonna be doing that again, so keep an eye out. For students who are interested in getting involved, the very first thing, because most of the work we do involves working with um, uh, conditionally systematically um, uh, under-resourced communities is to get yourself acquainted with the Institutional Review Board's Ethical Training Guidelines. It's an online course that really gets you um, uh, oriented to ethical research practices. That's one step. The next step is just reaching out and talking to me. Most of these projects um, involve students who are from the communities that we are working with and for. Um, that's a pretty important part of what I do. So my first step is always to, to sit down and talk to you, find out more about you and your motivations and your experiences and your aspirations and see how well they might align with some of the projects we have. Um, you know, we, we find various ways to, to get students involved. I'm Alexis. Thanks for sticking around to the end. Um, I am the director at the User Empowerment Lab where we study all of the ways that technology makes people's lives worse. I think you need to stay on this side. I hope that will help. Has this? Oh yeah. All right. No walking around for me. Um, so I work with, uh, I have seven fantastic PhD advisees, they're all listed on the left, and they would all love your support in carrying out some of their research. Um, we hear from participants all the time that the technologies that they use every day make their lives so much worse, so they feel like they're addicted to their phones, scrolling through content that doesn't matter, playing casual games long after they've lost interest in their objectives, um, that social media brings out the worst in them or in the worst in their friends. And so we take a look at what's happening for people in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, we examine the systems that lead to those experiences and we rebuild new ones. Um, a big part of what we do is take the findings from those studies back to policymakers. So we've presented our work at the White House, uh, we're working with the European Commission and the EU and the Federal Trade Commission here to help create policies for companies uh, that help people have good experiences. Um, so for, the, oh my gosh, that's like a kill. Sure. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Um, if you have ever used ChatGPT to write a text message to break up with a romantic partner, uh, we want to know all about your experience. 
Uh, if you are have ever uh, felt like social media was a toxic wasteland, if you've had uh, uncivil conversations online, if you've ever felt addicted to your phone, um, then this may be a place where you can find a home. Um, I do not currently have any paid positions, but we are always looking for volunteers, so I hope that you will consider reaching out. My email is on the left, um, so you can come join us for experience, course credit, and a chance to change the world. My name is Spencer Williams. Uh, I'm an assistant teaching professor here at the high school. Uh, and most of my research is around um, bridging the gap between um, science, scientific information, researchers, uh, and various different publics. Um, you know, if you, if you were, I'll talk a little bit more about like, why I use the word publics rather than, than, than public. Um, but for the most part, uh, I try to understand the phenomenon of uh, people using um, participatory web platforms, things like social media, uh, you know, podcasts, blogs, uh, you know, YouTube, TikTok, things like that, um, to, to engage with, with researchers, to engage with the science and the products of scientific information. Uh, you know, these platforms are becoming a more and more common way for people to, to get information um, about research, uh, about scientific issues, to make major decisions, uh, things around like vaccination, right, uh, where to move, uh, you know, how to raise kids, things like that. Uh, but there are a number of major breakdowns uh, in this process, right? Um, from the researcher's side, you know, discussing your work online can be very difficult. People don't really know how to do it. They're not very good at it. And it can be quite dangerous with issues of, of harassment, uh, things like that. Uh, platforms aren't necessarily designed to effectively support science communication, uh, right? You heard from, from Emma, uh, Jevin, uh, various other researchers at the high school who do a lot of misinformation work, right? Uh, you know, that, that's a huge issue that people have to contend with. Uh, and in addition, uh, different publics or different types of people have different needs. They have different understanding and relationship with science as an institution. They're on different platforms and they, and they come with different beliefs, right? So that can be very difficult to navigate. Um, and so primarily, uh, my research focuses on three major uh, kind of questions. First, how can we support researchers to, to more effectively connect with the public about their work? Uh, how can we better understand and design uh, online platforms with an eye towards better science communication, right, to support this kind of a process? Uh, and how do different publics make sense of scientific information online? Right, so some examples of, of my products that have fallen into this space uh, include you know, interviews with researchers to, to understand their experiences using platforms like Twitter to connect with the public, um, experimental work uh, and content analysis on platforms like Reddit to understand how the affordances of those sites affect how people engage with, with science news, uh, as well as a set of like, interviews and co-designs uh, with you know vaccine hesitant publics uh, as well and anti-vaxxers in terms of how where they get their news from how they make sense of scientific credibility uh, and how to design information in such a way uh, that it is kind of like more credible and, and useful to people who have kind of a more strained relationship uh, I guess with, with science as an institution um, and so uh, in terms of getting involved uh, you know if you want to work for credit there are certainly opportunities uh, you know, that would include both like independent study uh, as well as openings for, you know, research capstones. Um, I am also open to, to kind of like volunteer work, right? So if you're just curious about what research is all about, uh, you know, I'm certainly open to more low commitments collaborations in order to try out different research methods, topics, uh, and have kind of like low stakes discussions about how to get involved. Uh, and so if interested, you know, you can feel free to send me an email or a Slack. Uh, I didn't put my email on here, unfortunately, but I, I'm on the website. Uh, you know, uh, and we can talk about your interests uh, and what do you want to get out of the, the experience. Okay. 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 You can hear me, right? Because we got to close up. It is 1.30. You've heard them all. I hope you, uh, were, you know, got some insights, but also some inspiration. Uh, how many of you now think research rocks? Yes? Oh, come on. Give, give our speakers a hand.